Hello, this is Sean Harwell, and you are listening to the Never Heard of It podcast. And I am joined today, as always, by your co pilot, Craig Moorhead. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the movies that have fallen through our cracks. If you're out there in, in podcast land listening right now and you're sitting at your computer, you can check us out on Twitter at Never Podcast. You can check mm-hmm. us out uh, at uh, Never. Oh, damn. You can check us out at. Uh, <laughs> You can check us out at uh, neverpodcast.com. Is that right? See, no. It's no. Not, not at all. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, if you're online, you can check us out at neverheardpodcast.com. We're also on Instagram. And what's our handle on Instagram, Sean? Our handle is N-H-O-I-T podcast. That's right. How easy is that? <laughs> what could be easier? Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, in the modern interwebs, you can just search for Never Heard of It podcast on Instagram and find us. That's true. Uh, same with Facebook. We're over there. Or, you know, if you go to that website, you'll find links to all of those things. And we hope you do. Suggestions have been coming in, which is nice. I think we're going to try to get to one next time we do a full episode, and we'll tell you about that in the mini episode. Hopefully, we got some cool guests coming up. And, uh, Craig, I, I'm fighting a little bit of a cold here. I'm not drunk. Not this time. So if I start coughing, don't say anything. Just let me finish it out. I won't. We, we won't cut it out because we know people like to feel like they're just in the room with us. <laughs> yeah. Um, so imagine Sean is kind of in a blanket with some tea. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting across the room with a like a mask on, like a surgical mask, and just trying to keep my hands clean. And then you're wherever you want to be. That's the great yep. thing about this show. You can sit anywhere in the room. Yeah, I, I, I'm patient zero, yes. so just just keep that in mind. Are you doing okay, though, Craig? Uh, I'm doing fine. Right now, uh, I'm pretty healthy. Hopefully, that will continue. You'll get better, and we can all live healthy lives. Well, with that in mind, that's a perfect segue. Should we talk about some nuts? Man, yeah, let's talk about nuts. All right, the movie we are talking about today is indeed called Nuts, with an exclamation point. This is a documentary from last year, 2016, directed by Penny Lane, written by Tom Stylinski, which is another last name that I enjoy quite a bit. Mm. And Nuts, from Wikipedia, is an animated documentary film billed as the, quote, mostly true story, end quote, about the controversial medical doctor and radio magnate John Romulus Brinkley. The documentary is based on a screenplay by Tom Stylinski, adapted from The Life of a Man, the biography of John R. Brinkley by Clement Wood, and directed by Penny Lane. Nuts also won the Special Jury Award in the documentary category for editing at Sundance last year, so kudos to their editor. Um, Craig, as a fellow editor, I'd Mm -hmm. like you to keep that in mind when you're nitpicking this movie and its editing. I will. I, I had a lot of notes about how poorly edited it was, and I'm I am now deleting them. <laughs> yeah, I suggested this movie, and Craig, here's 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 how I heard about this movie. Okay, mm-hmm. I had some goat testicles put oh, inside no. of me. No. Oh no, Sean. I was listening to a podcast that was doing an interview with a musician named Kurt Ballou. And if you're a fan of heavy music at all, which I know you are, Craig, Kurt oh, is yeah. the guitarist uh, for a band out of Boston called Converge. They may not be in Boston. They're in Massachusetts somewhere. What else do you need to know? Um, He's a very, very well-known producer, has his own studio, and he mentioned that he had done some additional music for this film. And I think if you know his music at all, you'll be able to pick out those moments. I was able to do so. But I was like, well, that... That that sounds kind of interesting. What is this? What is this documentary that has to do with goat testicles? And then, sure enough, it popped up on Amazon. And I was like, hey, Craig, have you ever heard of a movie called? Nuts, that's a documentary. And I think that's all I told you, right? Yeah. And you said no. Did you have any clue what you were getting into here? No. By the time I sat down (laughs) to watch it, I can't remember if it was just because of the art on Amazon, but I knew it was about testicles. Right. Or maybe I had guessed it because I'd seen the goats humping. Well, it's called Nuts, so it's either that or almonds. Exactly. You know, it's like, yeah. Exactly. I wasn't either either a peanut farmer or it's going to be about (laughs) testicles. So... Yeah, so I, I knew that much. And then the rest of it, I just had to go along for the ride. 
Well, same here. I did not know anything about John R. Brinkley, the subject of this movie, and he indeed mm-hmm. was a real man. Um, we can talk a little bit about the the tag of saying a mostly true story. We'll get into that in a little bit. Basic rundown of this guy is that he grew up in western North Carolina, I think very poor. He went to the Eclectic Medical University of Kansas City, which was a real thing. And <laughs> I looked up today because I was curious about this. Eclectic medicine was mostly herbal and you know botany-based remedies that were studied at the time and I believe kind of went out of fashion completely by the end of the 1930s. But after this, and, you know, I don't know, but I, I feel like at some point in my life, this idea of, of using goat testicles as medicine entered my my brain. I mm-hmm. think I had some familiarity with that, but not really beyond the fact of, oh, it's just one of these, like, old wives' tales that it'll make you more virile and maybe cure impotency. But this man actually <laughs> did did perform surgery to that effect. Mm-hmm. And and claimed great success from that. Were you thinking about ingesting goat testicles today to get rid of your cold? I hadn't thought about that, but mm-hmm. if it'll work, my address is mm-hmm. <laughs> no. Um, I don't want anything goat related really here. I you know I got two <laughs> two dogs and a cat and some fish. Fair that's, enough. That's plenty, right? Fair enough. We said that we would like to actually issue a spoiler warning. We don't do that a lot, but because I think this is a movie that's probably not widely seen by a, a lot of our listeners at this point, and because of the nature of how it's constructed, we got to mm-hmm. talk about the last. 20 minutes of this documentary we really do Mm -hmm. so um if it's something that you're really like if you're you know prone to spoilers and that bothers you you know just stop come back after you've seen the movie it's very short it's an hour and 20 minutes and you can find it on amazon prime so with that in mind craig what did you think about this movie just general thoughts well first of all the story is the story of Brinkley is very, obviously very interesting. And you you can certainly draw a lot of parallels to, I don't know, certain <laughs> figures in our life today. Way too too many figures, I think. Well, you know? Way too many, yeah. I can't <laughs> some even obvious be specific. Ones. The, yeah. Yeah, there, there are some that dominate our every waking moment and sure. others that you might just think back on and think, oh, yeah. So, yeah, so it, it's certainly of interest and it feels relevant mm-hmm. to the times now. I liked initially the the animation and the way that was told. I have to say that as time went on, I'm 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 interested to, to hear that the editing won a prize because I have to say there were a number of times where I felt like no, I I felt like there was no rhythm to it in a way, and and, and I'm not mm-hmm. sure if I just wasn't grabbing on to something that the filmmakers were trying to say with it, but it felt like there were a lot of times where I felt like I was. I actually, I honestly wasn't sure if the movie had frozen. Oh, and wow. I had to wait for it to... Yeah, like... <laughs> it was buffering. It, it was, it, it, yeah, exactly. And, and it, so there were some things I struggled with. There were a few times where the filmmaking felt a little sloppy. It wasn't huge things about it. They were generally kind of minor things. But as time went on, they kind of accumulated for me. And they kind of bothered me. And we can talk about that stuff at the very end. So we can get into kind of the meat of the... The right. movie. But how did you feel about it, Sean? Well, Craig, once again, I'm in complete agreement with you. Mm. Your intellect oh. is right on point here. I think you hit the bullseye. And, you know, I do want to say, before we nitpick anything, mm-hmm. like kudos, kudos to them for, for getting this made. I feel like I can see their intentions. Mm-hmm. And the intentions are very, very good and very, very pure. And yeah. they found a really, really, really interesting story and got it told in film. So and, and, and documentary wise, I mean they they have they have like real footage. They have real mm-hmm. stuff. This is not a widely known story. So yeah. there is a lot of work that clearly went into it. There are yep. certainly sequences that work really really well. I, I don't want to make anyone think that this is like a horrible thing to watch. No, yeah. not at all. But I'm I'm with you in that. For me, I, I was thinking about it and and thinking about in the terms of documentary which obviously functions a little bit different than a narrative, a, a mm-hmm. true narrative film, uh, not a you know, fiction film. What I, what I think I'm looking for as an audience is the best possible delivery of information, right? Yes. Spe- yes. Especially something where you know you're, you're dealing with a figure who 
lived and died, you know? Right. And so it's like, okay, well, that's the chronology of this person's life. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I want to ingest that like as much mm -hmm. as possible. And I don't want things to get in the way of that. And I agree. I think there's times where the animation specifically, and also some of the, the other devices that they use, such as um, the film is broken into chapters. In fact, they actually use the literal book of the biography. You see mm -hmm. that at one point and you see a pair of hands turning the page. There's a narrator, and then there's a little bit of, you know, some meta stuff going on with the narrator by the end of it. I think some of that stuff, while really interesting and clever, and, you know, it does position the, the story in a way that kind of reflects the way that Brinkley's li own life unfolded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I really wanted that information. <laughs> and yes. uh, my wife watched this with me, and, I, you know, we talked about it a little bit, and I was like, well, I think we, we both kind of came away wishing for more interview footage because sure. there's, there's precious little, this is not a strictly animated documentary. No. And I, I think it's, it's a little, it was a little surprising to me to see that today in the synopsis that, that, that it was kind of pegged as that because yeah. um, it's not, it's, it's mixed with archival footage and mm -hmm. uh, photos and a few, I would say certainly less than half a dozen interviews, you know, you just standard talking head stuff. But I don't know. I just I I kind of wanted more from that. I kind of wanted those people that they positioned well as as having some knowledge on this man and at least the areas that he he worked in to tell the story more than the recreations did. Yes. And I don't know uh, if that's because yeah. of the effectiveness of the the recreation. You know, some of the 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 voice acting and some of again like yeah the pace of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like if that had been changed, would I have been like enraptured and kind of kept up with the pace? I think it would have been a significantly shorter movie and they might not have hit that feature runtime, which that's something we've talked about before. But um, right. yeah, yeah, I'm kind of well, with you, basically. That was one thing I kept thinking about and I can't help thinking about it, especially yeah. when, when there are those bits where I, I, I sit there and I think, I don't know why I'm looking at the image that I'm looking at right now. And and I feel like it's just being padded out. It it kind of makes me lose confidence in the storytelling. And so from then on, instead of sort of looking for the intentions of the filmmaker, I start to dismiss things that I don't like as like, oh, they just messed up, mm -hmm. which is kind of bad. And this is not a fair comparison for almost any movie. But lately, as I'm wont to do every two or three weeks, I've been listening a lot to uh, the soundtrack of Hamilton <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I was thinking about that compared to this and thinking about how propulsive Hamilton is the whole way through. And that's, yeah. well, I don't know, a two and a half, three hour story. It's a, yeah, I've never seen it, but I, I, the, I've listened to the soundtrack. It's a long, no. <laughs> it's a long it, soundtrack. It's, it's yeah. very long. And, and for me, at least, it, it, it just pushes you the whole way through. Mm -hmm. Each song leads into the next one and you're never left wondering, what am I listening to? Where am I? You are you are being pushed through this thing. There were so many times during this, a rather short movie, where I'm like, now I'm looking at images of flowers. Yeah. And I have no idea why I'm looking at these. Uh huh. And I don't get the answer for ten or fifteen seconds. And and, and it's but it's not it's not necessarily asking a dramatic question or mm -hmm. getting me more involved. I just kind of feel like, oh I've been I was in it and then I'm taken out of it. Well, and it's it's a bit inconsistent in that regard as well you know it's like if this were you know like Koyonokatsi or Baraka or something mm -hmm. <laughs> where the style sort of is the tone maybe you get away with those sort of those lingering moments but this is I, right. I don't think that was consistent all the way through so yeah right. but that that is an interesting comparison to Hamilton because yeah I, I think at the same you know you're learning and being educated to uh, history mm -hmm. through those songs and through that very non-traditional narrative. I mean, well, you know, I guess musicals and operas have been around forever, so maybe it's not that non-traditional. But <laughs> you're right; it, it does have sort of like this propulsion behind it that, that you know maybe this this doesn't quite have. Right. Um, so we're end of story saying this is not Hamilton. Yes, uh, this is how we're going to rate <laughs> movies from now on. Is well, it Hamilton look. or is it not Hamilton? <laughs> On this note, though, let me let me just pull up something here 
from the nutsthefilm.com website from the mm-hmm. director herself. And actually, I like this a lot. I, I, I don't know, you know, maybe I just haven't looked around enough, but I like, you know, there's like basically a director's intentions laid out in her own words on their website, which I think is kind of cool. Nice. So, quote, uh, and so Nuts is not a film that allows us to sit back and laugh at the dummies who fell for Brinkley's bullshit. Instead, it's a film that shows we are all those dummies. Unlike Brinkley, however, I seduce you and then I show you how I did it. Brinkley's story is not presented as an object of neutral nonfiction gaze, but as an opportunity for viewers to actively wrestle with the ethical and epistemological issues central to the narrative nonfiction form. And since I'm on a mission to prove that watching documentary films isn't just about eating your vegetables, the viewer is supposed to have fun while they wrestle with this stuff. And you could argue that there's tragedy in this story for sure, but it is, I I will say I I like the fact that, you know, again, like it, it at least feels like she's trying something different and it's, it's different for the sake of trying to be entertaining. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I think there's times where that gets in the way of, of actually the objective then. But um, I, yes. I, I thought that was important to point out. I thought it was kind of cool that she did that. I think so, too. I mean, yeah, certainly at the very least, like kind of the basic level when you're making a film, I feel like if you can make something that is not just like something else, yeah, whether sure. or not it fails on every other level, which this doesn't. But even if it fails on every other level, at least you didn't make something that's just like everything else. Yeah. Let's talk Brinkley. I mean, let's talk about right. the man himself now a little bit. What stood out to, to you about this guy and, and maybe sort of, I don't know, we can talk first half if you want, or you can start at the end. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, well um, the, the point I was going to make is the ending as a sequence felt so strong and it felt like yeah, it was wrapping sure. up. Like, I mean, everything that I'd watched up until then, even the stuff I didn't like felt like it paid off at the end. And I just felt like like my note at the end was just like, man, if the rest of the movie had moved like this and sort of paid off like this, boy, that would have been something. Not only that, I think the rest of the movie worked exactly as she mentioned in that, that statement. Yes. Because I did get like seduced into thinking... Well, this guy isn't that bad. I mean, it's kind of like he's like a folk hero. Like, you know, it's, sure. it's uh, uh, you know, good, good on him for fighting the uh, the American Medical Association and the FCC, you know, and, and trying to like basically be this this figure that, that helps people. And then, right. um, boy, in that last, yeah, in that last act there, you, you really see the malicious side of, of that, the consequences of that. And yeah, yeah. I, kind of, I kind of left feeling too, it's like, I mean, a great ending is a great ending, you know, <laughs> kind of in a lot yeah. of ways it excuses a lot of what happens before it. Well, and, and now here's something I should say up front, too, because I, I, I feel like there, there might be a few viewers who would have the same reaction as I, as I would. So going in, I didn't know a lot about what was going on, but that first sequence where the guy comes in and he says, basically, he's impotent. Yep. Can't have kids. He sees some goats doing it outside. Oh, yeah. And he says to our, our hero, well, you know, like, why don't you give me one of their nuts or something like that? But, you know, graph which, them on. <laughs> exactly. Which was so bizarre to me to hear that as an idea. Right. And immediately, Sean, I felt like that's not a true story. I think eventually it is proven that that, that was a true scenario. But because I felt like that's not a true story, the whole time I was feeling like none of this is true. Yeah. And and so I was kind of already a little bit beyond the middle when they say, you know, like so many of these things in this book are not true at all. Like this is not how your life laid out. So it was it didn't have a lot of impact aside from the like the drama inherent in the scene where he's being confronted with the fact that it's false. To the effect of... uh the truthfulness of this film. Another thing that I actually looked at and, and really think is c- kind of amazingly cool, they did on their website, they have a, uh, I believe, 300 footnotes that they did to the film. Oh, wow. Which includes screenshots, time code, what it refers to, and then they actually, they gauge their own truth value. So there's stuff where it's <laughs> like, okay, it's, in, it's invention, but it's probable based on this, and they explain it. Uh, and there's stuff that's verified. Um, and then there's like other things I saw that was made up completely was something like a newspaper headline that they included. So shots of that. And I, I got to say, like, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just completely gullible. I didn't I didn't pick up. On, <laughs> I never questioned that, that, that what I was seeing 
was it not at least true to the way Brinkley was representing himself? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know. You can question whether you even should call this a documentary or not. But uh, maybe we'll save that for another day unless you just feel really strongly about it. No, no, no. I I mean, I, 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 I see. That's the thing. I really like the way that that's structured, and I really like the thought mm-hmm. behind it. Yeah. And partially I'm a victim of just my own thought process. Sure, yeah. That instead of saying, oh, that was a true thing, I just started feeling like, that's not real. And so then, <laughs> and so then when... You're such a cynic, dude. I know, I know, that's, that's the problem. And so it's... So because of that, it's like when he goes in front of the, the committee, what, what all do they do? They, 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 they wouldn't let him practice any medicine... I can't remember oh, what, the, what yeah. the outcome of that was, but it was bad. Mm-hmm. And then and then there's a whole bit about how all these guys ended up dead. Right. And then and so then I started obsessing over that, but for a different reason. And I was like, <laughs> wait, is he killing everybody? Like it was yeah, such was a, a little, weird tangent I, to go on that they yeah. all died. I like I, I didn't understand. And it was just a setup for later. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess the thing is, it was taking up a lot of mental real estate. Sure. And so I was never like watching it and saying. Like, that's the thing. I, I wanted to feel like he was an underdog. And yeah. I could never get away from the feeling that he's, he's not. Like, he's just a okay. huckster. Man, and, and I smart, just felt that, th- that way the whole way through. Gotcha. Well, the underdog thing did kind of work on me. And, like, yeah. the stuff I really like, I mean, I, and I think that is admirable about the guy is, like, yeah, like, he came to this tiny, tiny town. I think they said the population was, uh, it was under 1,000 for sure, wasn't it, yeah. when he, it, Milford, Kansas, and right. set up shop there and was basically working, I think, as a pharmacist of sorts when this, you know, supposed exchange occurred with a man looking to have a child with his wife and, and bringing up the idea of, of this goat transplant thing. And then once he started doing the surgery, people started, you know, I guess flooding into the town. He built up the town around it. Um, mm-hmm. The population grew to several thousand. There were like churches and movie theaters and family centers and all these things built to the town. But then he also uh, constructed a radio tower. And at the time, I think it was the strongest powered radio tower in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, in this tiny, tiny town. And it reached, you know, he was broadcasting to basically the entire nation at a time, obviously, when, uh, when there was not a whole lot else to do in the evening inside other than listen to radio. And uh, What was the, uh, they were saying something about mostly radio was, what was the term? They're playing music, uh, pot, man, potted remember. palm music or something? Yes, yes. It's just it's purely sweet. happy background music. Happy background noise to sedate like, the masses. That's amazing. I looked that up. That was great. Yeah, not offend anyone. And yeah. so, and I mean, that was like the big thing was like that he came on then and he starts doing these like basically like fireside chats mm-hmm. where he's saying things about people's health and yeah. how they can do this thing to feel better and he's got the solution and you know at one point he goes as far as to calling himself a savior you know but it it is interesting to think about in terms of like radio and then advertising as well which they talk about a little bit like you know him doing things like are you feeling run down you know are you worried about having you know dying an early death like asking those questions yeah I mean that every like pharmaceutical ad you see now still kind of operates around that basic premise yeah, I mean, it, it's almost, it's it's marketing principles in general. I mean, yeah. just, you know, how can we ignore yes, death? Indeed. How can we always be perfect? Right, and this is not, you know, this is right around the time of the Great Depression, too, which would follow a little bit later. You know, he, he's, he's broadcasting country music, which I think was also the first time that that had kind of been that widespread. You know, it reminded me a little bit of, and I'd be curious to know if, if there's any sort of connection or reference um, that they used in Oh Brother Where Art Thou with the, the sort of the Papio Daniel character, oh, yeah. you know, and the guy that records the people in the can, uh, Stephen Root, that great character he played at the radio That's station. That's a good point, yeah. But yeah, all that stuff is amazing. And then, you know, he, he sort of, uh, you know, another thing I think that the movie really has going in its favor is this sort of built-in villain, the Morris Fishbine character who was, um, he had been a, a physician at some point, I think. I think he so. was at least, you know, had gone to medical school and was working for the AMA and, you know, was, they called him a crusader against quackery. And so he went after this guy hardcore and then, yeah, he basically found himself on the wrong side of the AMA and the precursor to the FCC, which I think was the federal radio commission. Right. You know, another thing that I love is like, I kept thinking about like, he sort of has this Brinkley has this, uh, 
you know, it's it's that Colonel Sanders look in a way. <laughs> like, he, you know, he's, yeah. he's wearing like these light colored suits and has that, that little sort of almost VI linen goatee look about him and then the round glasses. You know, he speaks somewhat eloquently and I, I think kind of I assumed he would just waltz his way into, into these hearings and bring all these patients that he had helped and that would be enough to win the day. And he found that was not the case. No. The shift in his life after that was, was really kind of fascinating because then he's sort of, you know, he, he's, he's kind of the classic charlatan in, in the way that, you know, he's got followers at this point and mm -hmm. is able to change his image to be the us against them kind of thing. Like, here we are. Right. Like, not only have I, have I helped your health, but here's this entity called the federal government which is trying to stop me from helping good people like you. And they don't want you to, to choose what, what, what's right for you. And, and right. I mean, that obviously is applicable today in, in so many sure. facets, even beyond healthcare. God, again, Craig, I feel so gullible now because you didn't have that experience. Where I was like, <laughs> you know, if these people feel like they got something positive out of this surgery, like who are yeah. we to say <laughs> well, that this is well, bad, you know? Right. And that's if one of the things... Dying, you know? One of the things I really like about the ending is they bring up that yeah. idea of the folk healer mm -hmm. and, and just that idea of like, sure, I mean, he's slicing a nut and just putting a dead nut inside of you. But right. for how many of those people did that psychologically help them? Yeah. And like, that's Placebo a real effect. thing. If you psychologically help somebody, that's a real thing. Like sure. You really did heal someone. Yeah. So, you know, e even if you are bilking them for lots of money if you got them over a psychological, a mental block, that is huge. Like, that's not something that can really be discounted. No, and as I also, you know, you can't help but also think about on the radio side. I mean, really, the, the, the problem there is, you know, it's a matter of free speech. And also, I couldn't help but think about this, you know, idea that we've, you know, that fake news that we, we can't avoid right now. It's in every discussion. Yeah. And that, that's really why they threw him off the radio, I think, ultimately, was through the advertising of things that, you know, hadn't been proven mm -hmm. in any sort of studied scientific way as being beneficial. I don't know. Like, to me, that's a tough line to draw because he's just saying these things. Like, right. isn't that, I mean, in a sense, like, he's not, you know, requiring somebody, you know, you should have the, I guess, the free will to listen to this and then decide whether it's crap or not i mean i don't know like sure it, it also like it was interesting to, to think about radio at the time in in comparison i guess to the internet which you know is, is certainly fighting regulation now and, and kind of where we draw the lines with that too yeah. um i don't know all that stuff was really really fascinating to me and then of course like you know you you move into sort of the tragedy of a man trying to to hang on to all of that right well and that that's the thing i mean he he wasn't really trying to help people. Wasn't he? Well, well, I, I, I don't mean, think he I was. I mean, he knew yeah, all he along what he himself. was doing. Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah, for sure. He, he just sort of lucked in it. Like, maybe the first guy he was trying to help. Yeah. And then when it kind of worked, like, he didn't know anything. It, no, and and it's kind of like thing. that great thing again at the end, which was really just great. There was that recording of his voice that he made for his son that they had oh, referenced God. earlier. Yeah. And it totally pays off because he's telling his son, whatever you do, tell the truth. It doesn't matter if you have all the money in the world. And it's yeah. like a real recording of his voice, I assume. Yeah, and it's I like, think he even goes so far as to say, like, it will haunt you if you yeah. get your like, money yeah. through false means and that kind of thing. Exactly. He's like, he's like trust me. You know, mm -hmm. I know that from experience, uh, which is a great way to end it. But, but I mean, I do feel like, I mean, there, there's a certain point where he definitely knows he doesn't deserve all the money that he's getting. <laughs> Right. Well, see, I didn't know because, like, I think figures like this is always interesting as a question of, like, whether or not they buy into their own bullshit at a certain point. Yeah. I mean, good question. Maybe he did. He also ran for governor, which I think sure. was another, like, fascinating part of the story because here's this guy as a write-in candidate who's getting thousands of votes in the wrong freaking state. Like, that's how popular he was. There were people sure. in Oklahoma voting for him, and he wasn't even running in that state. And yeah. then you got the whole thing where the elections board is basically saying, like, you have to spell his name exactly, exactly this right. way. Exactly right, sure. Which wasn't, like, the, the, you know, the way most people knew him. And so they had, like, 50-some thousand votes thrown out, and he should have won. But, you know, I always look at that, and, like, you know, obviously, like, the comparisons of modern politics is, like, 
okay, is this a man who knows that the current method of what he's done is unsustainable and that that, that house of cards will crumble? So mm-hmm. let me shift to this other thing, <laughs> kind you know, of, yeah. where, yeah. And like, I, I couldn't help but feel that, but it was kind of interesting. Then I think one of the interview interviewee subjects said that like, you know, he re- didn't really want to be governor. It paid $12,000 a year. He was making that a week easily yeah. um, doing these surgeries and things. But again, it's like, I don't know, man. It's like, I, I found myself wondering like this cult of personality thing. Like, is that like inherently American? Like, how many freaking times have we seen people do this exact same sort of rise and fall and like f- they find success they get rewarded for, for yeah. just bullshit like yeah. for just straight up lying and like pure hucksterism yeah and it hasn't stopped you know i mean obviously no. like i don't know i don't <laughs> know if that's just like a byproduct of of you know like the american dream or the self-made man or just like being the market system that we have that you know originally right. was supposed to like make the middle class <laughs> fairly attainable um for a lot of people so mm-hmm. i don't know but like all that stuff is in this thing and it's really kind of fascinating to watch it I got to say, like, I, I also love the idea that he then was like, damn it, I'll, go, I'll set up shop in Mexico. And like, you know, he gets yeah. a, a radio well, tower there. And then he's in on like 17 countries that's radio tower yeah. can reach. I loved that. And, 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 he's, yeah. and, you know, and he's doing all this stuff to get around these regulations. And then they say that, you know, he can't like re- record his voice and send it to the tower to have yeah. it broadcast. So then he starts not recording his voice, but like he was just broadcasting straight from his house to this tower in Mexico. And mm-hmm. then it's broadcasting him. So then he starts recording his voice onto onto records, yeah, and taking over those, and playing yeah. them to. And it was kind of that. I mean, it's kind of that corporate loophole type thing that exactly, happens yeah. here all the time. It's just like that's right. whatever rule they set up. I just find a way around it. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's that's kind of what brings me back to him. Why I can't have too much sympathy for him or think that he was that he thought he was doing you things good. I mean, yeah, good because I shouldn't. think. He was more focused on on doing good things for him and probably his wife and child. But but he knew like if if you if you take water and put blue dye in it and then say this is going to cure you, like you know yeah. you're full of shit. Even if a little bit of you is like this will get some people over mental blocks, like mm-hmm. you're definitely stealing money from people on false pretenses. So sure, but I I, I think yeah I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean I think the guy like look first marriage that nobody knew about the two daughters. Yeah. I mean like he left a life you know mm-hmm. in, in the dust and created an, a very new version of himself and and made millions off of that. I, I think like when I say like I don't know maybe he did believe that he was doing good. I I, I still think there there might have been that well, you know what? There's no harm that came from this. And like, look, these people had a baby after this happened. So who knows? That's who true. Knows? No, you one, know? no one died, apparently. Yeah, exactly. It's that like, okay, but who's the victim? You know, that's right. the thing. And and all of that. And like, and you know, he played that so, so well. Right, 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 right. You know, and, and it's always it's always then coupled with, well, the victim is me. I'm the victim. I'm the one being persecuted by these bad guys, mm-hmm. you know, and that just builds up the, the damn... But I, I do question why the hell he would have sued the Fishbine guy for slander, for libel. Because that's where all of that came out. You know, if the movie is true, then then everything that, that was sort of phony about him came out in that court case. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he lost his money and got sued by everybody and was dead three years later. Later. I mean, what do you, do you think it's just like pure arrogance that led him to do that? Because he could have just left it alone. I think he would have been absolutely fine. Like this, yeah. you know, he, he'd already been attacked by the, the AMA. This was not anything new. Yeah. Um, and this guy was like writing. I don't even think Fishbine at the time was writing for the AMA. It was like for some, I don't even remember where he made those remarks. But it wasn't like, you know, he, was, he wasn't on the radio reaching 17 countries. You know, right. I don't know. I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I think it was just arrogance. I think it was just he felt like I, I, I made this show recently about someone who was stealing. Uh, it was actually a actually a big story here in D.C. for a while. Can't remember oh, yeah. the years, but like in the last twenty years or so, this lady was embezzling money from the government. Uh, where I guess, I guess she worked in the IRS and did oh, it wow. for twenty years, and it just got to the point where you where she just felt like not only can she not get caught. 
but what she's doing isn't wrong. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, it's 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 just who, it's who she is now. It's that's that's her yeah. life. And I kind of feel like yeah, like he was kind of victim of that, which you were kind of talking about earlier. But it's like he'd been doing that for so long, had never been caught, ha- had these positive outcomes of some of the stuff. The the people were behind him. I'm sure he just yeah. felt like I'm going to make this guy shut up because that's the thing. Fishbine just wouldn't shut up. Yeah, like Fishbine would just come after him. So finally, he's like, I'm rich. Everyone likes me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put him down. And it was just, yeah, he just flew too close to the sun. Oh, man. And that, that's such good stuff. I loved when... <laughs> it's like perfect tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here they are, like, right in the Depression, and they're asking him how much money he made last year on the stand. And he says, uh, what do you say? I made $11,000 in, in 1937. 11000 like, <laughs> What most people would say yeah. one point one million. I prefer to say eleven hundred thousand. Uh, that killed me. I loved that. Yeah. Like I mean, that says so much about like the mindset of of a person like that. And you kind of know like, oh, he's he's in bad bad trouble here. I think if if there's one thing that I really felt was was missing from this documentary, it was more about the wife because she mm-hmm. did stick with them through all that. And you do get the you know I think they have the only recorded interview with her at the yeah. very very end. And it sounds like she went to her deathbed thinking that the goat gland transplant and then the serum worked. Right. Which that, you know, it brings that sort of like uh, blissful denial or, or what exactly was kind of going on there. But um, boy, as a family, they're kind of interesting, aren't they? Because they it's, are. sort of, it's so lovey-dovey. Like he, you know, films all this stuff with them and, and made mm-hmm. that recording. And um, I, it was, it's crazy because I wrote down basically Brinkley made a recording to his young son, Johnny, Johnny boy. <laughs> basically, I was just like, I like the recording that Brinkley made for his son. It's sweet and interesting. Yeah. And it was because it was just like, Johnny boy, this is your daddy. <laughs> um, I'm making this for you so that you, you know, when I'm not here, you'll understand and, uh, you know, know that you were loved and that, you know, you are the only boy that we will ever have and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I was just like, that's, you know what? Like, that, that's a pretty nice thing for a dad to, to leave to his son. It certainly does but, seem to show heart. And, I mean, there's yeah. no other reason for him to have made that. Fast I mean, forward yeah. to finding out that Johnny Boy shot himself in yeah. the 70s. And all I could think was, can you imagine having that record after finding out your dad oh, yeah. lied about everything? Yeah, like that's the kind of thing that would haunt you to suicide. I mean, I feel like you know, it's of like course. if you're making a the the Hollywood version of this, that record is playing when right. he kills himself. You know, well, uh, and think about this: like the the way you probably see your dad at that point is he's a healer, he's a surgeon. <sighs> all these people come to him. Yeah, you, you are rich as hell. Oh my God, they had a palace in Del yeah. Rio, Texas. <laughs> and then as a as palace. as soon as the hammer comes down, three years later, your dad's dead. You find out his whole life was a lie. Like, how yeah. bad would that mess you up? I, 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 I can't even imagine. I will say, I'm at least glad that it put an end to their fishing trips. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that video or footage of them is like, here's the, the seal that, that Johnny oh, Boy shot, shot with his yeah. gun. Here's the sea turtle that we had, you know, delicious soup from. And yeah. these gigantic tuna just hanging. I was like, oh, man, they just killed everything. In their they did. They went on vacation. Touching family memories of that turtle we killed. Yeah, I think that's the basic scope of this movie. You know, it, it's it's kind of a fun to go on that journey, and I, I do think the way they structured for that third act it really works in their favor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's about it, as far as I, you know, I have. I don't know. I mean, are there any other kind of like favorite little tidbits about Brinkley or the movie that? Um... No, I, I think thinking back on it, like I, I like the reveal of all the guys who were not dead. I mean, that <laughs> that is that is a good reveal, and and it kind of makes me want the sort of you know biopic of this, which it feels like I, I don't know if anyone could do it, but it's almost like like I want this movie to be made. Like Karate Kid. I want Charlie Kaufman. It's like if to do Karate it. Kid. Oh yeah. Okay. And then two thirds of the way through it, you find out that the Karate Kid's just just a liar. <laughs> like, wait, what? <laughs> but he, he's he's Johnny. Yeah, he's the guy we've been rooting. <laughs> he's for. Cobra Kai. <laughs> yeah. No, he's a he's a ninja. He was born a ninja. He just was. He was. Oh, yeah, Jesus. hustling you guys. Yeah. He killed Mr. Miyagi. 
<laughs> we just found him backstage. <laughs> That'd be uh, hold on. Let me let me write this idea down. Hold on, Sean. Yeah, put that down. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I, that bit is is certainly strong, and and the end uh, as well. What about you? What mm-hmm. what stands out for you? I really, again, like I I just really appreciated the actual archival footage, the interview stuff, and how that last sequence came to be and and really kind of walking us through what that surgery was Mm -hmm. because i I do think like you know i just kind of passed it off as like oh yeah yeah they they put some goat balls in in this you know human scrotal sack and called it a day you know and yeah i'm sure you know yeah some other stuff was done science whatever but no like they got the doctor on the stand he's like yeah no like basically they're they're just putting this in there's no blood supply to it whatsoever it's as if he has a foreign object inside of him and that's it and like that, it's so damning to hear. And then about the the serum, and and you know, finding out that it's ninety percent water and ten percent dye, and all that stuff. And you can just imagine, like, really, what it would have been like to be in that courtroom and hear that yes. as someone who had believed him. Well, and that's a good, qu- you know, that that brings up kind of a good question, which is, like, I'd love to know how he performed that first surgery. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to get into it. I mean, but that's the thing. I was like, I wonder if anybody will, will ever sure. know. Like, I mean, because that was one of the claims against him in that in that court thing was that, like, he didn't share any of that yeah. stuff. Like, any regular doctor would have published this. It would have been in sure. medical journals. You know, it would have been for the greater good of, of humankind right. to cure impotence for the love of God mm-hmm. as opposed to just saying, well, I'm the only one that can do it. You got to come to Milford, Kansas and pick out the goat in my backyard. Yeah. <laughs> Which I also love the idea that, yeah, he just had all these goats brought in and God knows what they were. I mean, I guess they were just cutting their balls off and, and discarding Ugh. them and, and, you know, putting a little bit in Didn't there. Didn't help but, the goats um, at all. I, I, it would also um, be really interesting to see more of that documented stuff of, of patients that had bad experiences. Yeah. You know, I think there were accusations made about him being drunk on the job by other nurses and stuff that worked right. for him, employees and that kind of stuff. and well, let me ask this, though, uh, j- just to go back to that for a second, because that, that brings up uh, another question about the same question. Like, who helped him on the first surgery? I mean, that's it's a little like going into a CVS right now, and I just go back to the pharmacist and say, yeah. could you put a goat <laughs> testicle in me? And they're like, sure. I mean. Do you have your CVS care card? Your... <laughs> yeah, do you have a, a rewards card? Oh, well, yes, of course oh, I have a rewards God. card. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because he himself tried to almost use that defense of 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you know, this guy that said, you know, wait a second, maybe surgeons should wash their hands after surgery. That guy was called an idiot, and he died in an insane asylum. And it's like, well, yeah, but that's all, like, that's circumstantial. But there's obviously a long history of, you know, the evolution of medical practices and it will change right. in the next, you know, hundred years too. But um, that doesn't give you much of a leg to stand on if you can't back up your claim. It's true. Although I would say, but if in like ten years, goat testicles really do cure impotence, wh- where are we with this movie? You know oh, what man. I mean? I think there's a sequel in the works, at least. I would hope. Yeah, I guess. I guess you should just <laughs> update it or something. It'll be nuts? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> I also, if she's listening, I, I, don't you kind of want to know if Penny Lane is her real name? I do. I, I, I liked on the site the, the disclaimer of like, you know, not the groupie, not the song by the Beatles. And, and honestly, but that's another thing going in because I saw Penny Lane, a film by Penny Lane. And so going into <laughs> yeah. the movie, I was still kind of feeling like, is any of this real? Like, is this a <laughs> joke? Like, yeah, so many questions yeah. the whole way through. I mean, if that's a real name, she can't help her real name. So what's she right, do? right. Am I, am, I, am I feeling like, oh, here, I'm watching a goofy movie while yeah. meanwhile her name's actually Penny Lane. There's nothing funny about it. Yeah, maybe she should have used like a middle initial just to make it sound like <laughs> prestigious. Penny D. Lane. A film, Penny D. Lane. We'll find her. I'm going to find her and we'll get to the bottom of all that. Please do. Please do. But I do think, I think this is a definite recommendation. Uh, The story of Brinkley is fascinating. And the movie, while I think has some execution issues for both of us that we might nitpick. We would. Is very enjoyable. I I didn't think it was bored. I do think you're right. There are moments where the pace feels a little off and it slows things down. 
I, I was entertained. I think my wife was entertained. And it leaves you with a lot to talk about, which I think is also exactly what you want from a documentary. It does. I think everyone should cue this up and watch it on January 20th and um, mm -hmm. enjoy it. <laughs> All right. Craig enjoyed it, as always. Uh, come find us online, neverheardpodcast.com. What are we doing next week? We're doing a mini episode, right? Uh, yes, there will be a mini episode where we'll talk about all the many things that you want to mini understand. Oh, man, we've been spelling that wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we may do some some Rogue One stuff that would involve a little bit of spoilers. So seriously, if you haven't seen that damn yeah. movie by now. Get on it. Whoo! Because we're about to talk about it. All right. I'm going to go blow my nose. And I'm also going to go blow your nose. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good night. Good night.